and welcome to the 3D Total Vodcast. My name is Paul Hellard. Today I spoke with Izzy Burton, an illustrator, director and artist, at present working freelance as an animation director with Passion Pictures and Troublemakers in the UK from her home in Brighton in the UK. We spoke about her award-winning uh, animated short called Via and delved into her history, her expanding collection of book illustration work and all kinds of stuff. Here she is. Enjoy. Welcome, Izzy, Izzy Burton. Thank you for joining us on 3D on the 3D Total podcast or vodcast. Um, I'm in Melbourne. You're in Brighton, in London. Yes, in, I am. In, yeah. 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 What's life like right now in in, uh, in Brighton with the lockdown and such? Um, it's it's hard to tell. Like it's been really good, but um, this week um, they're bringing back in new regulations, so we'll see what happens. But um, it's my birthday on Saturday, so I'm hoping that I can see at least some people. Um, that's the dream. But um, yeah, it's, it's going all right. We're, we're all surviving here. Happy birthday. Um, Thank you. <laughs> now, you're an illustrator, you're a designer, director. Um, yep. Are you an author yet? I've read a couple of interviews. Uh, you were trying to be an author as well. Yeah, so um, my agents, uh, my agents in the publishing world have told me that I have to put author in my headline now because they're pitching a book that I've written um, out there, which feels really strange to me because I don't like saying that I'm an author when there's nothing there yet. But um, I have written um, a chapter book for children and I'm hoping that a publisher will pick it up. But obviously everything's a bit slow at the moment. So we're just waiting to see if, if anyone's interested. Uh, but yeah, hopefully seeing an author. Fantastic. Now after graduating from um, Bournemouth University with a first class degree in animation in 2015. Yep. Um, you jumped right into it, didn't you? Tell me about that yeah. VIA project. Was that straight after your, your university? No, that was kind of, I think it was about like a year and a half in that I started that, um, like into my job at uh, Blue Zoo, but they hired me straight after I graduated. Um, which was very surprising for me. I had left university and um, I wasn't really sure that I was going to be able to get a job in the art world. Uh, so I'd kind of planned to get like a, a bit more of a normal job and just work on my portfolio. So I was like interviewing for jobs where I would create PowerPoints for companies and stuff, just something that was like a little bit creative. Um, and that was like, I did that for about two weeks. I was interviewing for some jobs and then luckily Blue Zoo found me because uh, the directors of that company, they, did my same university course. So they kind of look into our graduating uh, year groups each time from that university. Um, and they found my work and they offered me the job as a concept artist. So that was very out of the blue for me. And I couldn't believe it. It was like kind of a dream come true. I thought I'd be um, working for many, many months to kind of get to that stage of being able to get hired for a job like that. So it was, yeah, very surprising. And yeah, it was about a year and a half, I think, or almost two years into that job that I got the opportunity to make uh, via. Fantastic. Your your own story. I, I I've had a, a a view of it on. I think it's on Vimeo or or YouTube. It's on Vimeo, I think. Yeah. I think possibly on YouTube as well now, but yeah, Vimeo initially. It's it's emotive. It's colourful. It's uh, it takes you for a ride. Tell me about it. Yeah, so it was uh, Blue Zoo as a company are great at trying to get people to direct short films every six months or so they put out a brief and um, anyone in the studio can kind of pitch to make short films. Yeah. And I had, I was so adamant that I was going to prove that I had good ideas that every time there was a pitch I was pitching, and I kept losing the pitches I probably pitched like five times I think, even to the point of the last time um, I'd asked kind of, could the brief be a bit more about making something heartfelt because that's kind of what I wanted to do. And Blue Zoo is very much known for comedy and amazing character performance. So they almost made the brief so that I could like pitch something specifically and I still lost that brief. Um, so after that, I kind of said to my boss, oh, would I just be able to make a project on my own and just kind of use it as a personal project and fit it in between, like when I had downtime in between client work. So uh, my boss, Tom, said that that was fine, that I could go ahead and do that. So I initially planned VIA to be this very much a personal project. So it was much more, I guess, much more simple than what it turned out to be, because I was trying to think of the ways that I could create it entirely on my own. Mm. Um, and the initial idea was that I just wanted to show that I like to paint environments. So there was going to be a man that had a walk cycle and he just walked through the environments from screen left to screen right. 
um, and that's where it started and just to show environments and as the story kind of developed it was kind of lacking something and I wanted to have more characters and that's when I was um, told that I was allowed to use the 3D team in the studio to help make the characters and animate them and that's when the story came a, a lot more about a family and we could have the more characters going on and kind of install more of a story into the short film and it kind of developed from there so it was really nice because I think by trying to do as many of the jobs as possible myself I, I learned a lot of things during that time and um, I learned After Effects so that I could composite it all myself and do all the little effects and things so it was really good learning process and it's kind of got me to the point where I tried to tell people that they can make a short film with whatever skills they have and just try to find the ways around it because I definitely did things in probably very backwards way to people that are very talented at compositing and things like that but I found my way of doing things and I think in a way that creates quite a unique um, end product because you find like shortcuts and ways to do it in how you how your brain works yeah um but yeah yeah it was really good wonderful that that's that's also uh good in that with blue zoo you you were using their software you, it was an in-house project you were learning on yeah. the go with whatever yeah. software package or uh, anything in the studio that you could lay your hands yeah. on that was uh, a, a great step yeah it was it was really good and yeah just having that backing from people and mm. because it was a it was um not part of the main shorts program it was very much the main shorts program was like dedicated time to make those shorts but because it was me trying to fit it in around client work it would be like i'd work on it for maybe a week and then i'd have client work for a couple of months and i would not even look at it for a couple of months and then i'd come back so the it was spread out over 18 months whereas i think if we'd worked solidly on it it would have taken like three or three to six months sure. um, but actually that kind of i think in a way helped because um, I was able to look at the story and like have that time to develop it over a longer period of time and come away from it and come back and see it with fresh eyes quite mm. a lot of the time. Um, so that was really nice as well. And yeah, yeah I, I, I think it was nice to create a project without that pressure of it. I never thought of it as being something at the end. I think I was just making something for fun. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sometimes the best way to do it because I, it got to the end of the project and I was like, oh gosh, this is actually going to go out in the world and people are going to look at it. And I don't think I'd properly like got that into my head whilst making it. That's what I'd like to talk about now. And in that, that moment when it did actually go out and uh, be screened uh, publicly, yeah. tell me about that, um, that feeling of um, having that project completed and that's almost that's you that's that's what you want to show the world of yourself because being a personal yeah. project how did that feel and how how was it received it was really scary i think the the time when i released it there was the first time anyone ever saw it was my bosses went to do like a presentation internally to some age advertising agencies and they sh showed it to them and it was like the first time anyone had seen it and i suddenly had this realization that i was like oh gosh like this is like really part of who I am and I think mm. like I said because Bluesy was known for comedy things I thought oh I'm going to come across as the like 24 25 year old girl who's made something really silly and uh, like this and that and I just I thought it was going to be ridiculous and then when they came back from those meetings they said that the people at the agency some people had cried and that they really loved it and that was the first time I'd had any kind of proper feedback on it apart from a few of my colleagues mm. and that was really nice and then as it kind of got more out there and people kept saying, oh, I can relate to it. Or I think it was like um, abstract enough that you could like lots of people said, oh, this feels like my life or I can relate to it. And I just couldn't believe that that had happened. I think yeah. I was so worried that it was going to be taken. I don't know, just see, seen as like a silly thing. Mm. And the fact that people could actually feel something for it was really lovely and unexpected. And I and again, like I said, I because I hadn't really thought about it going out there when it when it was finally done and I put it out there, it was suddenly like this hit of anxiety of oh gosh, like what what are people going to think about it? But it was yeah, it was received really nicely, and I think again that's down to the fact that I created it without thinking of it as a final pro like product, and I just thought of it as a passion thing for myself, and I mm. did something that was very authentic to me, and I think when you do things that are authentic to yourself, then people can relate to it because they can, they can see that there's like a real human thing behind it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
tell me with the with the um the book illustrations i'll jump across there just quickly um a book yeah. illustration work which is what what percentage of, of work is the books at the moment for you so at the moment just because i've started a full-time job now it's kind of slowing down but obviously i've with freelance you kind of book yourself up so i've mm. got books that are overlapping now so i've got still quite a lot of books that i'm doing more in my like evenings and weekends but last year i was i've been freelance for a year before i got this full-time job and the freelance whilst i was freelance it was almost like 80 percent of my work was book work yeah. um it really just came out of nowhere there was just all these things to do and it was it, it was really exciting so i'm glad i spent like a proper year really focusing a lot on the books yeah. side of thing um so, oh, the, sorry the so, reason i was asking is um what what difference does it make creatively i mean you you earned yourself a lot of creative confidence with that uh, the animation work do you yeah. feel uh you can expand yourself out with the books um and uh, cover work that you're doing now built on the confidence you've you've created yeah i think so and i think it the i've always wanted to illustrate books but I found that like when I'm doing animation work, people always say that the animation work is very illustrative. Hmm. And so I was like, oh, I definitely should do illustration. And now that I'm in the book world, everyone says that my illustration is very cinematic. So I've learned that I very much sit in this, I feel like this middle zone hmm. where it's like a little bit of both worlds. And I feel like I was a bit worried that I didn't fit in either. But I think by doing that, I've made almost a style for myself that my animation work is very illustrative and storybook like. But then my illustration work has got like a, a cinematic feel to it, which um, I think has got me the book projects I've got so far. So mm. I think um, it's nice to try and swap into that world as well and try and tell stories in like a much more limited amount of images, obviously yeah. per page and um, and things like that. And book illustration cinematic wise, it, it, it leads to that center spread, doesn't it? I mean, you're, you're, you're pulling the reader through or the, the watcher of the picture book. Uh, through the yeah. book um, a yeah. lot of that talent of working your way through a, a storyline in a movie or, a, or a, a, an animation is the same yeah. as going through a book isn't it exactly and I feel like when I start a book project I start with like every page as a, yeah. a small thumbnail like a storyboard to check that like I'm not doing too many pages that are similar but each one is like a different camera angle and the publishers love it because I keep calling them shots and camera angles and I uh -huh. refer to it as a color a color script instead of a color rough because I'll look at them all and try and have like some kind of color thing going through um, yeah. so that it feels a bit more like I'm using those things and I feel like a lot of illustrators do do that but I feel like having the animation background it allows me to think of things in a certain way and how I'm going to like use certain um shots essentially to show the story as well so i think it definitely benefits to have those kind of both those backgrounds mm. um to bring okay i'm going to pull you back into your childhood you grew up in the english countryside didn't you um with a view of the rivers and the and the mountains behind um and you grew up um drawing picture books and illustrating them and uh, i Okay, Beatrix Potter comes to mind, and I know it's the yeah. not the first time that's been brought up because it's the obvious uh, segue. What's uh, this is this is a, a kind of life's work for you, isn't it? Yeah, I feel I, I recently felt that it's lovely because I feel like the stuff that I loved as a child is what I'm doing now as a job, and, as a career. Yeah. Um, I, yeah my mum saved so many of my like little books that I wrote when I was five and six and they've all illustrated and there's lots of pictures of me like lying in my garden writing in notebooks and things and I That's just great. feel like yeah I just everything seems to have come back and even the fact that what I draw a lot is environments in nature and I feel like that's because I just spent so much of my childhood like running around fields and things and just sure. in and um and even the fact that I grew up predominantly in the English countryside, but when I was three to five, I lived in Connecticut in a in the USA. Oh. And um, my mum thinks that there's definitely some kind of North American like aspects of my artwork. And she thinks that I was at that very um, influenceable age of like absorbing things, but not really realizing it, being almost like subconscious. So I think there's so much like even silly things like at the moment I'm trying to make a picture book about these little moss creatures and I've, I've kind of put it aside but I need to pick it up again and that definitely comes from 
being a kid in America, we had this very mossy garden with loads of mossy walls and stuff. And my I used to tell my brother who was younger that the moss was tiny palm trees and there was little uh, like palm trees for ants and there was little creatures living in them. And so there's definitely little ideas like that, that I would make stuff up and they're now becoming the stories that I want you to bet. tell now. Yeah. So yeah. The fairies <laughs> at the bottom of the garden. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. great. Um, so let's see, I'm, I'm looking through, I've got one particular project I'd love to, to get you to talk about, the, the Wonder Tree. Um, yeah. This was, what, a couple of years ago? So actually just finished it probably this time last year. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So it's only been out since July, um, but it's the, it's the first book that I illustrated and it's the first book that came out and it's yeah. written by Teresa Heapy and I'm hoping... Uh, she's actually just written a second one for me and we're just trying to see if it's going to get the go ahead to do like a not a sequel but like a similar type of um, kind of nature book mm -hmm. um, and yeah it was just a lovely first project to do because it was all forests and animals and all the things that I, I love and quite a poetic text from her which yeah. again really suits me um, that's great and yeah it was a really nice project to start with in the kind of illustration and publishing world did you get much guidance from um, the author and uh, whoever else is in her team to create the, the, the characters or were you given free reign? So for this, um, I did, I think I did a sample initially for so another book project they had. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't get that book project, but they gave me this one and it was very much I think for characters, it was very much free reign. Like I just drew some different owls and kind of showed them what I liked and they really liked that. And um, they, the publisher, you don't really talk too much to the author in these processes. Mm -hmm. I, I chat to her separately kind of on social media after, but um, during the process, it's mostly the publisher and the art director in the publisher. And they had uh, one piece of my artwork that they loved and that was the style that they wanted to go for. And I found that, quite interesting with a lot of the publishers they'll come to me normally with one image of mine that they love and they want it like that and it's normally an image I've done like three years ago and I'm like oh gosh can I still draw like this and I have to try and remember the the style I've drawn in uh, sure. but they kind of like gave this as a starting point and then that's kind of what I used to kind of focus myself as I was drawing mm. um, and the publisher this publisher is Egmont and they were they were quite hands-on with giving feedback and like directing what they wanted and color scripts and things. So that was, yeah, it was quite an interesting process. I've working across different publishers. There's definitely some publishers that just completely let you go and mm. I do whatever. And there's some that are a bit more hands-on with like editing things. So it's, yeah. it's interesting to learn the differences between them all. Okay. Um, I sent you a couple of questions before the, the interview um, about inspiration for the characters. And I think that leads from those the, this talk talk from the uh, uh, the book work where yeah. where do you find that I mean uh, as you say you get guidance but uh, yeah I don't I guess it's a lot about I try it's weird I try to look at other people's artwork but yes. never when I'm actually drawing it myself so it's kind of like I guess collating in my head like a kind of library of what I love from other people but never using it as like a reference too much but I think in general for characters especially when I'm coming up with them they're often influenced by people I guess if it's people characters people I know so for instance I'd made a short film last Christmas called Stella and Stella the woman in it is definitely my grandma like it's 100% my grandma like what she wears everything and even um, I recently did the cover which is out now with a character design quarterly which are with 3d total mm. and um that character is just inspired by um my heroes as a kid so as a kid i wanted to be a zoologist and my hero was charlotte ullenbrook who was uh, a zoologist and like then like kind of moving on to like jane goodall and diane fossey mm -hmm. and stuff so i feel like there's a lot of things of just pulling in either people i know or my heroes and things i love so like the wonder tree was great because um, my mum is really into birds so I grew up I was like that strange five-year-old that knew all the names of all the birds so I, I feel like that was lovely for me because I could be like oh it'll be this type of owl or this type of thing and 
I, I draw a lot of ravens in my work, I feel, because I just love that type of stuff. So it's definitely all these little influences from growing up and things that I was taught about or people I knew. Right. So, yeah. That's a passion. I think that it's also a, um, the kind of child that uh, I, I actually look up to because you're educated. You use yeah. everything. You suck it all up and um, you yeah, use it. Um, yeah. Now, this project, obviously, um, it fills your mind with all sorts of different ideas. And uh, yeah. the, the two book projects you mentioned um, are right down your, your alley, right down your road. Yeah. You know exactly. It's a passion. Um, yeah. A creative springboard comes to mind. Um, yeah. Aren't you lucky to have had projects like that that uh, have allowed you to jump into your own backyard, as it were? Yeah, I I feel like I was actually speaking to this like about this to someone yesterday and just being like I've been incredibly lucky in the fact that storytelling is what I want to do with my life. Mm. I've only recently realized that everything I do like writing, drawing, creating films is all about storytelling. And I every single role I've had whether it's in animation or um like in publishing and stuff now is I've always been allowed to have my own ideas and influence things and like I've always been in a position right since I've graduated to sit in a meeting and say this is what I think this is my idea and that's great and even even now of this um working with Netflix I've at, in the beginning of this very core team for a new project and because it's right at the beginning we're able to influence what's what's going into this project to some extent and I just feel like it's really exciting that not only am I drawing but I'm allowed to have ideas and actually come up with creative solutions for things and that's all I could ever dream of, I guess, like mm. just being able to um, have that extra thing. Cause I, I love drawing and I love that, but I really just want to be able to help like make ideas the best they can be, whether it's my idea or someone else's idea that I'm um, just kind of almost consulting on. Um, That's right. So yeah, I feel, I feel like I've just been very lucky to like draw projects like you said, that are kind of what I love, but also mm. in, hopefully influence where they go and the direction sure. they take. I want to be very careful. Be very careful here because I need to ask you: How much can you talk about the Netflix projects that you're working on? I don't think anything at all, apart from to say no. that I'm working on an unannounced kids TV show because it's very early days, and um, hopefully, um, I don't know when there will be an announcement. Maybe at the end of the year, I'm not sure, but um, mm. it might even be later than that because it's at the very start stage of it. But no, it's like an absolute dream project and dream team and. It's just so exciting to work with so many like talented people. I think I just feel like I'm going to learn a lot. Um, mm. And it's a project that's definitely pushing me. And like some of, some of the work I've created so far is definitely my favorite work I've ever drawn, uh, which is also frustrating because I just want to show it to people. But yeah. um, no, it's just it's very early days. So hopefully sure. um, maybe next year there'll be an announcement. Um, but it's a really, it's a really exciting project. I think that's about all I can say. <laughs> fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, now I'll get into your working from home. Yeah. Um, and uh, what is your studio like? Do you work um, Photoshop, Painter? What's, what's your application of choice? Or are you traditional and you scan? So I almost predominantly just work in Photoshop. I have Procreate on my iPad and occasionally I use that for like sketches for storyboards and kind of initial character designs and stuff but mostly it's I've got a giant whack on just here yeah. out of shop um, and that's kind of what I mostly work on I love using inks and earlier this year I I did a test piece where I, I drew it with inks and then edited it in Photoshop to kind of bring more of the stuff I like into it but I'm definitely not very skilled in traditional stuff but I would love to kind of explore that a bit more um, but I think I like to try and make my digital work feel as traditional as possible, like to have have that kind of sketchiness and looseness. Yeah. That, um, and I think that's also, I obviously do use undo and things, but I when I sure. work really fast and I try to set time limits, I try to almost like draw in this fast way that there's mistakes happen and things aren't perfect shapes. Mm. And that's normally the work that people prefer of mine. And I think it's just working that way that you're not being precious and, not deleting all the things that make it um, 
loosen kind of have energy which I think sometimes in digital work you can overwork things and I yeah. definitely try to keep it loose and feel like yeah. it's something that you've drawn physically as well mm, you don't want to lose that organic sense of you know pen to paper yeah yeah I feel like that's definitely interesting as well with the going back to the wonder tree project is the piece of art they selected that they liked and wanted it in the style of I'd drawn in one hour and so when I when I made the project, I told them that the, the sketches before to be signed off were going to be super loose because when I painted it, I wanted it to be super loose. And I wanted to almost paint with that speed in mind and not have like too much of a set sketch set down because then I knew I would be really careful and it would not be the style they wanted. So I actually had to do that project in an almost like speedy mindset to keep yeah. the style that they wanted, um, which was quite interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, because the appearance of these characters, they you, you've you've got the the two D pastel um, that that almost granular look of of the edges and uh, it looks wonderful. Bearing in mind of uh, uh, your work, filmmaking, animation, and you're very visual. How much yep. does lighting come into your two D design for your characters, even as a uh, illustrator? Yeah, I feel um, my thing has always been lighting and colour and mm. atmosphere. So I always say to people, like, especially when I got my first job, I wasn't, I still technically not very good at drawing, I don't think, but I feel like my thing that I've always understood was colour and making an atmosphere. So I feel like lighting is super important to me, just in a sense of like, that's how I can tell a story. And it's definitely a really great way just to bring life to your pieces and to frame characters and make a focal point and I think that's the best thing with um, trying to make an image especially when illustration as well that's supposed to tell like a whole story piece in one image which is the same as concept art or anything like that is that you have all these devices you can use to tell that story whether it's the composition or like the values and so like light can be used for those values so I try not to go too glowy but I use edge light a lot and and kind of like shafts of light and things and I think you have all these devices and color obviously as well to kind of help tell that story and I think that's something that I've just always loved is trying to create that mood and atmosphere to make people yeah. feel something um, in an image and um, I actually posted some style frames that I did with one of my studios for a pitch that we didn't win uh, this week on Instagram and Twitter and someone had said oh that that image made me all emotional like and it was just like this beautiful it's supposed to be this moment in the film where it's all glowy and happy and there's birds flying and it's supposed to have that really warm kind of soft comforting feeling and the fact that people can look at it and feel like that is really is really nice because that's obviously your objective is to kind of give a feeling through an image um and lighting is like 100 percent one of the most important things for that i think yeah yeah one last question about working from home and in your own home studio do you leave that very much during the day to get out and see the, the the outside as much as you can, of course, in this? Yeah. So I've actually just literally this week swapped studio space. So I was working from home. Okay. I'm now working. I'm now working in my boyfriend's living room. So he's just <laughs> sat over here um, on the other side. And actually, that's quite nice because I feel like it's nice to have a separate workspace and it's nice to also I've been working with my housemate but it's nice to have that other person to chat to and like um, he's also creative and in the kind of animation and film okay. and games so we have very similar kind of stuff that we do but yeah we are very lucky that the sea is just like at the end of the street so we yeah. can um, kind of go for a walk or whatever and get a coffee and I try to like I feel like I'm someone that if I'm inside all day my head feels physically yeah. fuzzy like it feels like I've I haven't like taken a big enough breath so yep. I definitely like to go for a walk and when I lived in London I always lived like as close to the river as possible because I found that I could breathe easier near a body of water so that was definitely a big reason I moved to Brighton to be near the sea and have that kind of even bigger body of water to kind of calm and kind of refresh me so I definitely if I get stuck during the day I just go to the beach and it makes you feel like you can breathe a bit deeper and then you can come back and feel like you've refreshed yourself and sure. reset completely everything. Completely understand. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah. great. Um, final question. I've done a little bit of background research to, to uh, before this interview, but um, I have to ask, did you get a dog? No. <laughs> I was actually talking about this this morning. Like, oh gosh, I, I almost got a dog last summer, but it's just one of those things where I feel like 
I'm so likely to move country, hopefully, or something for a job at some point. Like I'm yeah. supposed to be in LA for this job and things, and it just doesn't seem fair to get one and then possibly move. But um, they're definitely like my favorite thing, and it like makes like I stroked one outside the coffee shop earlier, and it just makes my day better if I see one. So I'm very hopeful to have a small dog or a large dog curled up at my feet one day uh, yeah. whilst I work, but um, not yet, unfortunately. <laughs> That's our time for this evening. Thank you very much, Izzy Burton, for joining me on the very first 3D Total vodcast. And uh, it's been great talking to you. And uh, I wish you all the very best of luck in the next few months. We're all crossing our fingers. This thing gets out into the background as soon as possible. So thank you very much again. Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely. Good on you. 